E aí, pessoal, sejam bem-vindos a mais um Duna Missengout, episódio especial aqui, tá? Eu tô aqui com o cara, tô aqui com o Theo, tô aqui com o Theo, que pegou a gente de surpresa aqui, eu não sabia que ele ia gravar essa aqui com a gente, então eu tô um pouco nervoso, eu confesso. Mas, mas eu não sou o convidado hoje. Exatamente, o Theo tá aqui hoje pra somar nessa mesa, porque a gente trouxe um pastor aqui internacional pra conversar com a gente, então a gente precisa de um pastor aqui também, trazendo o seu lado pastoral, né, Theo? Mas você é um pastor também, né? Não, 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 não. não, não. De coração, certo. É, um de coração todos nós, né? Mas e a gente, essa conversa a gente vai estar tá aqui. Não, tem uns que não são. Que não são chamados, né? É, Muito bem, mas isso é para um outro momento, falar. exato. É. Mas a gente está aqui, a gente está com um pastor internacional, é, a gente já vai apresentar ele aqui, mas só para você entender, toda essa conversa vai ser em inglês. Você que já é do Hangout, tá ligado que a gente é global aqui no Dunamis, então a gente vai apertar o nosso botãozinho aqui para trocar para inglês. Então se prepara, se você não entender, tem aí as legendas que o YouTube gera para você. Ou então, cara, se prepara, recebe aí para você aprender cada vez mais em inglês. Então, vou apertar aqui o meu botão. Now only in English. Okay. All right? Let's go. Let's awesome. do it. Let's And do it. today we have our international guest here, Pastor Mike Kai. Thank you. Pastor thank Mike, you. thank you. Thank you. Well, obrigado. Oh, now in Portuguese. Okay. <laughs> no, it's in Portuguese. No. Yeah, so yeah. Mike Kai is here. It's a pastor in Hawaii. Yeah. We want to talk. We want to know more about you. We have Isaac Felix What's up, as, guys? Well, as well, our worship leader. Later, but today he's with us helping us with theologic uh, issues or yeah, <laughs> yeah let, let, let's let's we, we, every time we want to talk with some more deeper we're gonna ask you all okay. Right? okay 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 I'll Pastor be here Mike. if you need me <laughs> okay <laughs> Pastor Mike I think he's gonna be better at that but you know okay Pastor Mike welcome thank you for coming here using this like this time to be with us we, we know that after here going back to Hawaii how 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 many hours the the, the whole flight uh well I'm, I'm honored to be here first of all thank you so much for having me I've watched your guys podcast I, I I don't know what you're saying but I'm laughing a lot with you guys oh, I know yeah, I know good. it's great um it's gonna take about nine uh, nine or ten hours to get to JFK and then I have a short layover and then another nine or ten hours to get Whoa. back to Honolulu so wow. it's almost a day flying yeah but It's totally worth it, though. You go home refreshed, filled, grateful, and filled with vision, you know? And with meat. And with meat. Yeah. I mean, I've eaten so much meat, past tail. <laughs> He just gave me so much meat. And We just came from churrascaria. Oh, yes. That's so awesome. awesome. Mm -hmm. A lot of meat. All right. I kept so declining it, though. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank really? you. Yeah, it's too much. Thank you. A lot of picanhas. But Titus ate a lot. Titus yeah. ate a lot. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> What's what the meat that you like it most? What, which meat? I like the most I actually enjoyed the lamb really yeah yeah, yeah. Wow. the lamb no, was good well, the lamb was really good yeah, yeah. yeah. awesome yeah. I like lamb too with um, the sauce yeah I, you know the chimichurri kind of the chimichurri, sauce yeah. and some yeah. olive oil or whatever it was it was delicious alright let's Brazil. talk about barbecues we could do yeah. that too we could do that too we could actually talk about kalua pig you should ask me about <laughs> yeah. kalua pig How kalua pig, kalua pig? Mm -hmm. yeah. what is a kalua pig <laughs> in, in Hawaii you make a, well I'll let him explain okay yeah. so, so like a lot of parts of the world is Philippines and even South America they take a pig and they put it on a you know a pole between it and a spit and you just slowly rotate mm. it right you know and like even in Thailand they'll take coconut oil and they'll keep on like painting it over the skin of the pig by the time that pig is done that skin is golden brown crispy you know what I'm talking are you guys hungry right now oh I'm, yeah it, I'm it's, getting like hungry it's right right you can just hear just it just listening to it you can hear it I can feel my blood pressure yeah. rising <laughs> yeah you hear it when you crack the skin but yeah. to Kahlua a pig means like you have an underground oven called an emu and you dig out the earth and what you do is you line it mm. uh, you end up lining, lining it with banana leaves with tea leaves and then you get your pig and you put no pole in between it you, what you do is you cut, you slit it open after you've cleaned it and and tail knows this you get hot you get rocks brown hot rocks, rocks. Mm. Yeah. like you cook like, like in the, the, inside the, the inside the pig in the hole in the hole right? very white hot rocks and wow. you put them inside the pig And then you close it up, and then you begin to. You could 
you can throw a turkey in there on the side. You can th th throw some ribs on the side, and for about you cover it up with burlap and with uh, banana leaves, banana leaves and chicken wire. Okay, because you're gonna have to carry it out with chicken wire. And the Hawaiians didn't have chicken wire back in the day, but that's what we do. We improvise, and then you cover it up with the earth again. You know, all all that, all the the layers of banana leaves and tea leaves. Leave it in there for about six to seven hours. Take it back out, and it's done. Maybe it's so good. It is is delicious. It's wow. the Hawaiian experience. So, yes, yeah, so those way Hawaiian, Hawaiians do it. So you're not getting a, a pork chop. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You're not getting a pork chop. <laughs> no. You're not getting a baby it's back rib. It's the Hawaiian rib. way to yeah. much more than that. Oh, yeah. There's no totally. baby back ribs. The whole yep. thing it will be shredded. It'll be shredded because oh. it's fall off the bone. And it's the Hawaiian way to eat pork. Yeah, yeah. And let, let's introduce this. Like, you were born in Hawaii, right? Yes, absolutely. Because, because for us, like, we know a little, like, we know United States, but Hawaii, it's whole different yeah. like culture and everything mm -hmm. how was like born in, in that in that place you know it's, it's it, it was a blessing to grow up in Hawaii um, especially the era that I grew up in number one okay great weather year round we might have mm -hmm. had a rainy season we got a, a rainy season mm -hmm. you had to be prepared for an earthquake or uh, eventual uh, uh, the occasional tsunami volcanoes. alert volcanoes yeah volcanoes volcanoes erupting right <laughs> okay. yeah. volcanoes 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 guys occasional yeah, tsunami yeah, you die from <laughs> That's the ocean not that okay. I mean. <laughs> yeah but for us it's normal right it's like like, okay, tsunami warning. So you get, take to higher ground. Okay, the, 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 it's going to erupt, so don't go near it, you know? Um, but it was a blessing to grow up in the post-era of sugar plantations. Mm. Sugar plantations were king. Uh, now the king industry in Hawaii is tourism and the military and government. Mm -hmm. Those are the main industries. You take those away, Hawaii doesn't have jobs as much as we have. Mm. Uh, so I grew up in an era where sugar was king and it's on its way out. Um, and in that... 70s and 80s, ch real childhood in the 70s, 80s growing up uh, during that time, um, it really was like the best time. Uh, we had uh, our pressures, you know, we had, you know, we called it today bullying, right? Yeah, you had that. You learned <laughs> how to fight. You learned Holy how to fight. Bully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We fought a lot. You know, Hawaiian kids fight a lot because, you know. Yeah, just tell us, show us a video, remember, like in the, in the parking lot. Yeah. Two just, guys fighting kids each other. Kids just fighting. And after they just hugging. Like, yeah, like, what? okay, so we just, we just punch each other in the face. <laughs> right. It's all good. Why? Why do you guys have this? I, I think there's a warrior edge to Hawaii kids. Um, um, growing up in Hawaii, and there's something about being the 50th state, probably one of the smallest states in the United mm. States of America, isolated from everybody else. And, you, you know, it's kind of like this, we're not a pushover, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not a pushover. You're not going to walk all over us. That already happened in the past. That's not happening again. Yeah. And it's systemic. Unfortunately, it's systemic. It's this kind of fight mentality. That's why Hawaii and Brazilians, well, Hawaii is some of the best pound for pound MMA fighters in the world mm -hmm. come out of Hawaii with over only a million people. Not 22 yeah, yeah, million yeah, in yeah, the city, yeah. a million people. Exactly. So when you look at Max Holloway, okay, we're going to yeah, MMA, BJ is that okay? BJ yeah. Penn. Who, yeah. You look at those guys. Kimo, back in the day. <laughs> remember Absolutely. Kimo? Yeah. <laughs> Bro, these guys could scrap. This is like the, the real, you don't remember Kimo. No. No, I don't. Kimo? MMA? No. The guy that came with the, with the huge cross? No. Hawaiian guy, anyway, he was the original one. Yeah. I mean, like, like going back to Kimbo Slice kind of days. And these guys were, <laughs> so it's just a warrior mentality and then sometimes wrapped up in an inferior priority complex because mm. we're a smaller state um, and when you go away to the mainland you go to college they love the Hawaii kids they mm -hmm. love them they pick them up on their football their volleyball their baseball their basketball teams yeah. um, in the soccer teams you know why because they have heart mm. that's what it is it's, it's, they have heart yeah that's and I think awesome. like because you guys like live like in islands nearby the like the beach the the, the nature mm -hmm. the the costumes are different like it's not Hawaii similar. Hawaii culture is very similar to Rio Real, right? Yeah. Real. So mm. you guys like to play sports. You guys yeah. not like into like cell phones or video games. That's no, why. no, more no. in touch with nature. Yeah. yeah, yeah. On the beach is right there. Get out of the house. Go to the beach. Go do something. Get, get in the, the so, great outdoors. So you did. You did not come from a Christian background, although you have Christian heritage. Mm -hmm. You were born in Hawaii. Uh, just 
tell us real quick because I know this weekend we heard a little bit of your testimony. But real quick, how did you find Christ? Yeah. Okay, I was I, I was raised in the Catholic Church. Okay, okay. and um, my parents were Catholics, mm. um, and my other grandparents they didn't know what they wanted to be. They were Protestants and then they converted to Catholicism. Mm, oh wow. And I think the reason why they converted to Catholicism, my dad's side, which is the missionary side, I'll, go, I'll get to there, is because when my grandmother was bedridden because she had a stroke, um, the one that came to visit her was the priest. The priest. Mm. Wow. And when she was in bedridden for 25 years, you know, she was bedridden for 25 years, so, you, so she had that electronic bed or whatever, and the bed yeah. would come up mm, yeah. and the priest would come over once a week and play cribbage cards mm -hmm. with my wow. grandmother and my grandfather. <laughs> and she goes, I like these guys' version of Jesus, wow. or at least what I know of, and to take away all the saints and all of that, you know, yeah. she just saw real religion lived out in this mm -hmm. Catholic priest. So we grew up in the Catholic church uh, and I was grateful for it and didn't know anything else. There was no other options. I mean, the, yeah, Jehovah's Witness, that was the option, or Mormonism, that was the option. Catholicism was the only thing that I knew of growing up in my rural town in Hawaii. So uh, mm -hmm. I became, I, I had a heart to serve. I think God used that heart to serve. Yes. At a very young age, I became an altar boy um, and I was grateful for that really? training. You I became an altar boy? I was an altar boy. Wow. And I, and I had- Show me the big. I had great <laughs> priests. I want to say thank God for my priests. And one of them, he, um, he I started doing funerals. Really? Yeah, people I didn't know. But, you know, they say, hey, can, Michael, can you do a funeral? I'm like, yeah, I can do a funeral, Father. And I'll show up. I'm fourth grade. And they give me $5 to, to, just to look holy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> With my robe <laughs> on. Yeah. They didn't have to you say know, anything. I don't say anything. I just, like, hand the priest the Eucharist. And, and then, <laughs> Just you know, pay respect. And just people just liked Michael and they liked my friend Andy. They liked my friend Robin, Robin Gomes. And That's awesome. We were all the Funerals boys. with my guy. But there was something, yeah, but there was something about, about being in the house of the Lord at a very young age mm. and not even grasping the concept. Wow. That from eight years old until probably 15 or 16 years old, I was an altar boy. Wow. And so I had commitment to God. Yeah. I was scared of the statues. Uh, I would, uh, you know, there's something, something that made me scared in the church sometimes. Mm. Would you I, say it was like, like a godly fear or not really? Just I, scared? I, I think it was a godly fear. Uh, this is before all the like crazy... reverence, respect? Reverence, respect, and and, the, and Jesus is always on the cross, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know anymore. I haven't gone to a Catholic church in a long time, but Jesus is always on the cross. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so every time I walk around, I felt like Jesus' eyes were looking at me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, and this like, I go yeah, that yeah, side. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. eyes wide. And, and, there, and with that came kind of like a fear of God, a fear of the Lord. Yeah. yeah. And then... By the time I was 17 years old, I just didn't want to do this anymore. 16, I didn't want to do it anymore. And um, so I ended up, um, by the age of 17, I moved to the University of Hawaii. Uh, so I live on a small, a big island, but a very small town. Mm -hmm. He knows the island. He's spent a year there. And um, went to a very small town from 2,000 people. I, I, I loved my high school. I got to play every single sport year round. Never had a break except for two, maybe a month in the summer. Small school, you can play everything. So football, yeah. basketball, baseball, track. Played it all. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, if I went to a big school, I'd have to specialize. Exactly. Yeah, you can't play all three sports or four sports. Yeah. So uh, University of Hawaii, here I come. Graduating class of 120 kids in my high school. And I, I get there and uh, small town boy hits the big city. Mm, yeah. Small town boy hits big city. Uh, yeah. I made the same thing. Yeah, that happened Yeah, he, he's from a small town, came yeah. to the big city. That's awesome. And I know yeah. what happens. What happens? Your story, like you can continue, like. <laughs> well, exactly. what's your story? No, 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 no I'm not here to talk about me. I'm not here to talk about me. Clearly, I, no, to I what relate, you're saying. I relate, like you're in a small town, now you're in a big city, different girls. I was I lost. I was, I was lost. <laughs> like literally lost when I got there because I didn't know Jesus, mm -hmm. even though I went to church. Mm -hmm. So awesome. I was spiritually lost anyway. Mm -hmm. Then I get to Honolulu. I'm I'm culturally lost mm. because you find it so different from it was so different Wine Man? 
from Honoka'a. Oh, yeah. Okay. It was so different. It was like the University of Hawaii. I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like um, culturally I didn't fit in. I, I felt like nationality wise I didn't fit in. Um, I, I, I'm mixed, so you can't tell what I'm at, what what I, what I might be. I don't know. I can mm. I can pull the Howley card and say that I'm Caucasian. I can do Hawaiian. I can say I'm Filipino because I am. Ooh, I yeah. can say all these different things. But I was lost there. But what I what I found was a group of friends that I, I made friends with. But then what I really found was the thing I shouldn't have found, which was ladies' night on Sunday's night Ooh. at a bar called Moose McGillicuddy's. <laughs> <laughs> ladies' night on Sunday night. Yeah. yeah. Sunday night. Oh Sunday night. God. Ladies' night. And that's not good for a young for a 17, 18 year old <laughs> boy. You know, in the big city. Who's pretty? In the big city. Who's pretty innocent. <laughs> and so I end up um, um, meeting a, a lovely young lady. We fall in love. Yeah, I hit it hard. Like I, I hit hard because this is my first girlfriend, real mm -hmm. girlfriend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I grew up. Um, liking girls 100% um, but the pool was <laughs> small <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to make that clear make everybody that clear today that needs to make things real yeah, clear yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean because uh, I didn't really have a girlfriend because the pool was smaller <laughs> Mm, okay. okay. The pool. Yeah. No was more smaller. Not, no not many options. Not yeah. a lot of options, and the and they were all taken. To be honest, they were all taken. You finished the game, and that was a late bloomer. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, um, <laughs> when I went to the University of Hawaii, I'm in the Air Force ROTC program. Mm -hmm. I'm on my way to be a pilot. I'm in my second year of the program. Um, this is before Top Gun, Tom Cruise. Before that even came out, okay. Mm. I just want to go on record and say that. <laughs> okay. I was jumping on a bandwagon. Not, not just yeah, because yeah. everyone. I already was had a letter just go with the flow. <laughs> trying to be Tom Cruise. No, no, okay. I wasn't going with the flow. Um, you look like him. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll take that. I, I guess I'll take that. I, I received that. Okay, so then the, the second thing was, I had a chance to play basketball at the University of Hawaii, and I don't tell this story very often, but I'm, I'm going to tell it anyway. Yeah, go for it. I got to ask, we had a brand new coach, they let go all of their players, and the coach hit up five guys that grew up in Hawaii, the brand new coach, and said, I need five local boys to be on this team just for one year if you're good enough you can play you can play beyond that and I was one of the five really yeah mm. I, I got U of asked H. at U of H University of Hawaii that's awesome they were watching me pick, during pickup and said we like this guy hey Mike coach wants to talk to you I go sit with the coach Riley Wallace he says if you have enough credits we'll take you the problem was I was working a full time job and I only had nine credits and you needed 12. And I said, mm. great, no problem. I'll throw on another class. This is too late. Can't, really? You can't do that. No, so man. there were my hoop dreams. I had an opportunity to do it and then, but it's, it's okay because God had other plans. Mm -hmm. So as I said earlier, I fell in love, hit it hard. And of course, if you're going to do that, you're going to eventually, there are going to be some, you know, some results. Mm -hmm. And the result was, I was told that I was going to be a, I was going to be a father. Um, how old were you? I was 19. 19. 19. 19. Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah. How old are you? I'm 27. 27. Okay. How he just became a father. Yeah. Actually, last month my daughter was born. Well, oh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Praise God. Children are a gift from God. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. at that time, I had to quit school because I had to live up to the responsibility, and I was happy to. And um, but it, there, there goes vision. There goes dreams. Yeah. There goes. There's a song. There's Lanny. A, yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a country song by Kenny Chesney. You heard of him? Yeah. <laughs> the song is called, I think it's called There Goes My Life. There Goes My Life. Yeah. There Goes My Life. There, there Goes, my, goes life. my Life. <laughs> like, it's all over now. But there's a redemption in that song. Oh, yeah? The girl grows up in the song, and now he's giving her away for marriage, and then he says, There Goes My Life. Oh, wow. Mm. That was my life. She was my life. Wow. And so... Um, it's a good, like, sermon title. There Goes My Life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, write that. that down, man. Yeah. So, um, so we 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 take the responsibility, you know. Um, we we being you and the and her mother, the mother. Yeah, mm -hmm. we bring her into the world. All right. Um, and so I'm working. I'm hustling jobs. I'm working three part time jobs to equal one full time job. Whoa. Um, or at least a job and a half. Um, I'm I'm pumping gas at night, and I'm at Pizza Hut by day. Mm. Wow. Yeah, and I was not happy. I was like. Oh, Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm meant for more than this. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with pumping gas. Pumping yeah. gas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nothing wrong with working at, at Domino's, yeah. Papa John's. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. 
But when that becomes your sole source of income, not a supplement to what you're already doing, and this is your future, you can't see far, and then it, you start losing vision. And I don't understand vision at 19. I just understand like, where's my, what, what am I? What, why am I here? What am, what am I going to do with my life now? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I was going to be in the Air Force. I was, you know, Air Force, 100. Mm percent -hmm. And so now you go through a crisis and an identity crisis, and it really was an identity crisis. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't know where I'm going. And then things begin to fall apart with her and her, her mother and I. Mm -hmm. And in, within two years, it, it got bad. I was not the ver best version of myself. Uh, I, I wasn't even the best version of myself coming into this. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know the yeah. Lord. I didn't yep. know the Lord. And uh, she was not the best version of herself. Um, but what happened was I ended up taking the responsibility and wanting my daughter to live with me. And she she went on and lived her, her new life. Wow. And God bless her, um, but I got the blessing. I got to raise my daughter. That's so, awesome. I mean, there's nothing like um, you're sad, you're lonely. Now, I don't want to belabor this point, but you're sad, you're lonely, you're hopeless. Um, <clears throat> you are even angry and you feel, you feel robbed mm. at this point. Mm. And, and it's unfair. It's unfair. And I, I feel unfair for my daughter. Mm. Like, I feel sorry for her. She's mm -hmm. asking for mom. She's wow. asking. Oh, oh, man. So I would imagine. I, I, she was how old? She was two, three, four. Oh, oh, my five. God. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so she would cry. At, I would cry at night. Like, not like bawling. I would cry. And she could tell. I'm, I'm holding her. Mm -hmm. And oh, she's man. patting me on my back. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Yeah. That's rough. And those are the days I imagine. that uh, those are the days that I ended up grabbing a Bible that I had somehow. My mom had it in the house. My mom and dad had to move up to come help me. Mm. Um, mm. My dad started a new business, started a couple of businesses, and they came up to help me. And that was in year two. And it, it allowed me to, mom and dad allowed me to go hustle, go grind. We'll watch, we'll watch Courtney. Wow. Go work. Mm. Go work. Mm -hmm. Go go find purpose. Go do that multi-level marketing thing. Go go go. We support you. Mm -hmm. And it was that. But then, <clears throat> my, my, before that, when things were getting so bad, my friend Brandon would tell me at this restaurant that we worked at. He said, "Look, you gotta you gotta come to church with me, Mike. I think you'd love it." I said, "I don't want to go to church." Um, because my version of church is what I grew up with and yes. I didn't think that was going to do anything for me. And, and then so my mom said, you know, you know, if you go to church, you can't take communion. And I think she was right. And I was like, what? I can't take communion. So why would I want to go to church? I said, I, I stayed. I, I stayed. I didn't leave. Mm -hmm. And I can't mm -hmm. take communion. Mm -hmm. The one oh, that's that's that, that's that wasn't right. So from there, my my friend Brandon. Says, now she's talking about Catholic Church. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. She's talking about the Catholic Church. So in your mind is like, what what uses it for me to keep going to the Catholic Church now? Yeah. Well, yeah. Your friends that invite you is not from a. Uh, no, no, they were from a charismatic church. Charismatic. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I didn't know the difference to be honest until mm -hmm. I went. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I go back and I say I'm grateful for my Catholic experience and my my religious training as a young kid. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but when my friend Brandon. Uh, kept inviting me, inviting me, inviting me, inviting me. To Come on, Finally, I got tired of him inviting me, so I said, I'll go one time. And then after that, I'll get you off my back. He goes, great, if you come, I'll buy you breakfast. And <laughs> as God is my witness, I said yes, like within two seconds, because it's free breakfast, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what else am I doing on a Sunday? <laughs> so he picks me up. We drive 30 minutes to the church. I'm overdressed. I dress up my daughter. And to be honest with you. Why are you overdressed? Like, yeah, how overdressed? No, no, why? But why are you wearing, wearing like suit? No, no, no. Because when, when I was going to church as a teenager. Uh, Catholic church. Yeah. You know, you're going to dress nice. You're going to dress nice. You're wearing, you're wearing good pants. Uh, a nice button down. We're not okay. wearing hoodies. Got you know it. what I'm saying? <laughs> I thought he was like with a suit. Baggy t shirts oh, and hoodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were not a suit. That, that no, did not fly no. back then. No. Right. Suit with a scarf here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A scarf. <laughs> That's our thick scarf. You mean a, <laughs> no, a scarf? Like in a handkerchief. <laughs> handkerchief. Handkerchief. Sorry, sorry, guys. A pocket square. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. I love it. And so, anyway, I get you. 
<laughs> Sorry, Pastor. No. So you went there overdressed. Bro, you speak you speak more than one language. Yeah, I admire that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, we're Americans. We only speak one. Anyway, and in tongues. <laughs> yeah. 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 So he's three. Yeah, yeah. speaking tongues. <laughs> um, and then, so I, when he got me there, I was so nervous. Mm. And I walked in. I didn't know what to expect. I, I was afraid everybody was going to judge me when I walked in. Mm. Without, I, I didn't even use the with word the, judge. Yeah, with the Back kid. then, nobody used the word judge. Stop judging me. Mm. Uh, oh, <laughs> stop judging me. Yeah. 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 You can't judge me. I feel me. so judged. Only God can it. judge me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I feel shame. <laughs> yeah, and back then, he was just like, I just think every, everybody's going to be watching me walking with a little girl. Where's the mom? Mm. Mm. Well, that didn't happen because Courtney went to... Kids ministry, kids ministry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and I went the other way sat next to my friend Brandon and I walk into an environment where people are like happy clappy in time I come from a karaoke background cool okay <laughs> karaoke <laughs> but yeah. we call it is a real pronouncement it's yeah, karaoke. karaoke yeah it is Japanese yeah okay so to drown my sorrows at that season of my life I would go out to a bar with my friends called Kangos and Kangos Kangos man Kangos <laughs> and Kangos would give you this first place that I ever <laughs> they would give you free soybeans with Hawaiian salt on it like the, edamame edamame okay edamame first place I ever had free edamame <laughs> and then you eat the edamame and then of course you're gonna you're gonna order something to drink because it's salty yeah because it's salty <laughs> it's a great <laughs> strategy and yeah. there's a karaoke bar that had this big binder and you would flip between what song you wanted to sing yeah and you'd go down and you'd pick the song and the guy with the, who's running the show you give him a dollar and so back then <clears throat> I, 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 I'd go there to draw my sorrows and I'd sing a lot <laughs> I'd sing George Michael Careless Whisper <laughs> Careless, uh, Careless Whisper, Careless Whisper. <laughs> Whisper come on I would sing show us Pastor now I, well, no my, my voice is shot today but uh, I just oh, I, preached, I preached my we heart out you. this week <laughs> preached my heart out this weekend um, and then um, I would sing Al Green's Let's Stay Together Let's Stay you Together know? yes and then so when I go into church um, I'm watching the overhead transparencies and the whole overhead projector and the worship words on it and to me this is how I, a non-Christian mind said these are Lionel Richie love songs but they're to God <laughs> wow <laughs> So, <laughs> you are the sun, you are the rain that makes my life this foolish game. You could put God's name in there instead of her. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. It was no longer am I worshiping that girl, I'm worshiping God. Mm-hmm. And, That's cool. And so, they had me on song too. So, you're I'm crying. I'm tearing. Presence of God is there. I, don't, I can't explain it. Wow. I'm tearing in song too. And now I know why. Brandon's what, been trying what, to get What are you me. thinking? I'm thinking... I'm, I kind of like this. Wow. Mm. I like this. That's cool. I could come back here. Um, and so at, when the song was done, when worship was done, uh, the pastor got up and preached, Pastor Ralph. I, I don't even remember the sermon. Um, but I, I do remember that that day that, you know, back then it wasn't raise your hand or come to the front. We were a charismatic church. We weren't Pentecostal. Mm-hmm. It was make eye contact. Everybody, heads bowed. Eyes closed, make eye contact. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. I have never seen that before. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird. So that's like, like so everybody the, uh, bow their heads, and if you want to. So that's like the altar call? Put your head up. Yeah. Put your head up and look at the Oh, pastor. so everybody's. Yeah, bows, everybody's. And then if you want to say yes, <laughs> you look at the You pastor. look up. Dude. Yeah. yeah. I had never seen that. Never heard of that. Maybe yeah. it's more. I think it was a California, a California Calvary Chapel, um, Hope Vineyard Chapel kind of deal? beach deal. Yeah, I think. Be- yeah, uh, I think it would have been more expressive. Okay. Um, knowing that they flowed with the spirit. Um, okay. Yeah, and that was my first Sunday. Wow, my first Sunday. Which, so you made eye contact. Did you repeat the prayer? I did. I repeated it in my heart. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Don't repeat. We weren't a talk back to church. Mm. There was no talk back culture. In fact, when somebody tried to talk back to encourage the pastor, the pastor didn't like it. Tell him, to, tell him to knock it off. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out this guy here. Yeah. So he says, "Amen." Yeah, he's, he's like, like, "No, no, can no. you stop? Please, You're like, throwing me off. <laughs> You're distracting me here, man. You're yeah. Distracting me. Yeah. Wow. So you get saved. Yeah. Then you start going back to church. I start going back to church. Um, start learning. We we carpool. We carpool. Then I start learning. Um, I'm still though. There's a part of me that's still in the world. Mm-hmm. There's this, there's still, I'm, like, I'm straddling the fence, mm-hmm. but I'm st- but I'm leaning in the right direction. I'm straddling the fence. I'm not perfectly balanced. I'm leaning in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And there came a point where I said, look, I'm either going to do this at all in or I'm not at all. 
And when life got tougher, and it got tougher, when you know the, the longer period of loneliness, mm -hmm. still fighting to stay together, when that wasn't happening, I had to lean more towards Jesus. Yes. And that's when I went, you know what? The world has nothing for me. Uh -huh. This world has nothing for me. And I cut it off. I like severely cut it off to the point where I cut off a few friends. Um, mm -hmm. God repaired those relationships, but I had to because they were work friends who would go to the bar right after. When you make cash tips, yeah. it, it'll burn a hole through your pocket. Mm -hmm. You, know? yep. you don't want to eat because you're still, you, you, you're still vibing yep. from work yep. and you got to calm down. Yep. So that was going on a little bit too much. I cut that off. I cut this off. I don't go there anymore. I'm not mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, And I said, I'm so out for Jesus and then yeah, but when you like you realize that you're you were calling like to not just serve in the church but like being in the ministry lifestyle like full time because you, like you in this process but when is the the tipping point <clears throat> the tipping point is when I met Lisa mm. your okay. wife yeah so like I'm, I'm single for four years okay we went on four years single and celibate the writing is on the wall it's wow. you can uh, biblically I can move on Mm. Mm -hmm. Biblically, yeah. I can move on. The writing is on the wall. Yep. The word, the word, the, and you don't want to see it. But the writing's on the wall, so I move on. And I stay single for one more year. And I leave my wedding ring on. And I say, Lord, I'm going to leave this wedding ring on for one more year. And I'm going to be married to Jesus. Wow. So now we're going on my fifth year of just me, Jesus, and Courtney. Ooh, and wow. work and business and just hustling mm. and at the end of that year that's, that's when I prayed I said Lord I need a wife and my mother needs a daughter Ooh. and so if I can get married you mean she, uh, my daughter needs a mother yeah 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 <laughs> my mother I need a wife a, yeah. and my mother needs a daughter <laughs> <laughs> my daughter needs a mother yeah. Yeah, it's the wrong order yeah, yeah that's, that, that, that's just weird if it happened like that anyway I just said <laughs> Lord I need a wife and my daughter needs it's a mom. mother yeah, yeah she really does so, so she's how old now she's six seven yeah. oh wow yeah uh -huh. yeah Yeah, and so I prayed specifically because I heard a pastor named Jack Hayford say pray specifically. I thought, who am I to tell God what I want? That's what mm. I thought in the beginning. I wasn't telling God what I wanted. I was asking him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, may she be five foot seven, okay? Yeah, five foot seven. You make your list. Yeah, I had a list. Yeah. Because I, I knew what I wanted now. You know what I mean? It wasn't, I, like, I wasn't just going to go, you know, like, who have me? You know what I mean? Like, I felt, like, honestly. <laughs> I mean, like, you have more self-esteem than that. I felt a little, yeah, I, and I felt a little bit like damaged goods. Mm. And it, ha it would have to be a package deal. Like, it, it's, it's not going to be a girl that's going to want me but not want her. Mm -hmm. and, or tolerate her. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, we are broken. You know, we're kind of, we're broken. And uh, we're gonna hide it. We're gonna try to heal it the best we can. So I need a woman who is five foot seven. She's got to be gorgeous Chinese, okay? Because there's a billion of them. So you got to be real specific. <laughs> <laughs> That's authority, guys. Can we say if you just say she has to be Chinese, like it's a big pool? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah really cool. Well, they're all they're they're all great people. But here's, here's, here's the one thing. God, here's the one thing. I said I said gorgeous. I just want gorgeous. Yeah, okay. to me gorgeous. To me gorgeous. Five foot seven, gorgeous Chinese. Uh, loves Jesus more more than me. But the crazy thing was when I saw Lisa, I didn't even know if she was Chinese, Korean, or Japanese. I couldn't tell. And I said, mm. doesn't matter. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Please, please be Chinese. Please be Chinese. <laughs> yes, come on. Come on. Yes. She yes. doesn't understand anything. Yeah. Why? I'm just and you know what I thought? I thought we, and part of it was, I thought we'd make beautiful kids. That's the thing. You know, I thought, wow. Yeah, that's, that's a Asian, good line. That Asian That is a good line. Good, <laughs> we yeah. would make beautiful kids. You know that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want you. We got to make beautiful kids. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, So we ended up getting, we start dating. She asks me out because she, she, like I said. She asks you out? She asked me out because she, I went to a, I went to a young adult's Christmas party. Okay. Back then it was called Singles Ministry. Oh man, there's a hookup. <laughs> Singles Ministry. Singles Ministry. Ministry. Remember that kind of stuff. If we do this nowadays. Not good. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> nah, nothing good will come out of that for sure. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so you went to this Christmas party? Yeah, and she, she was, was there. She was working the table, and she had the guest list. Mm. And so um, I said hi. She said hi. We talked.
talked. Everybody group went, went on a group deal. We went to go eat. I went to go eat. We were we ended up being across from each other from the table. Um, kind of there was some chemistry, and she was five foot seven, and she definitely was Chinese, and she loved the Lord. And wow. I said, you know, this could this possibly be the one? Anyway, she calls me the next day, and uh, she calls me the next day and says, "Hi, this is Lisa. I was wondering if you wanted to go." I'm like, "Wait, wait, what? what? Like, who's this what? girl calling me on? <laughs> calling me out? Yeah, when I go out on a date." And um, but I was oh, part of me was thrilled. The other part of me was trying to play it a little hard to get because um, <laughs> this was too easy. <laughs> this was too easy. Like no way. Yeah, yeah, she's coming like, after me. <laughs> like I prayed and it happened. Wow. And long story short, we went out. Um, we enjoyed each other's company, but I think we had a hard time that like, we couldn't see each other enough because of my daughter. Mm. And so it wasn't your typical dating relationship. Mm. Um, it was on the phone. It was sporadic. It was at church. And um, we broke up. <clears throat> really? Yeah, we, we mutually broke up. Um, well, when she went back to the list, I mean, now I just joke around with her. I said, you, you abused your privileges. You know you could get fired for that today. Calling somebody on the list, asking them out for a date, that's wrong. <laughs> I said, hashtag me too, that's wrong, you know? Hashtag me too. So I girl feel picked up my number from a guest list and called me. <laughs> but going back to, we broke up, and that was good, but I couldn't get her out of my mind. And I called her every day because I didn't want anybody. I didn't want anybody else calling her. I didn't want any. I wanted to make sure. sure. You, like, state your territory. I wanted to make sure. And then probably about f six months apart, I said to myself, uh, "Why am I waiting for somebody else?" Right. You know, you're waiting because you, you're waiting because you're not sure. Is there going to be someone better coming along? Is there, are you going to miss it? And then I realized, no, she's the one. I, what am I waiting? And I, I proposed to her. Uh, and like got, you just went straight for the proposal. I went straight for the proposal. Whoa. Yeah. You guys were broken up, right? Yeah, oh, but yeah. we're talking every day. Yeah. But we're talking on the phone oh, every day. Talking every day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, building a friendship more than anything. Maybe now it's like the some guys need to listen better. to this. Yeah, man. I, yeah. <laughs> this is a move. Of, go for it, a man's guys. move. Yeah, just go for it. So, so we planned the, the wedding proposal. in three months. No, no Pl big deal. Planned the wedding in three months. What do you think about these kids that are like planning the wedding for like a full year and a half? Yeah, oh, they're gonna get themselves in trouble. Come on, they're gonna, they're gonna overspend. They're gonna end up sleeping together. Oh, they're, gonna, they're gonna ruin yeah. the wedding gift too early. They're gonna open the gift too early. <laughs> open the gift too early. That's good. It's it's the temptation is don't just you feel like yeah. people are like, so great. They, they, they're so focused on the wedding that they don't understand that it's just a wedding. I mean, it's not just a wedding. Like, yeah. but you're gonna have to build gonna, a marriage. Yeah, so people, yeah. So in, a life together. So are people holding off for four four years to five years because they don't have a venue? Yeah, exactly. No, right. That, that makes no sense in my mind. Here's what I would do. If I were you, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would go to your pastor and get married in a small, intimate wedding, and then plan your reception four and a half years from now. And in two years, you think that I don't need that big reception anymore? Exactly. Take your, get your deposit in back. My, yeah. Get your deposit car, back. Yeah. And get ready to buy. Get a, a down condo. payment on a house. Yeah, down payment. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, totally there's easy. too much room for the enemy to work, mm -hmm. and too much room for good you word. To, That's a good word. To talk yeah. yourself out of this. Yep. And That's now a you're good word. super committed because you've waited this long you've put all this money thousands of dollars into this and then by then you're stuck you can't get out I'm, I'm not saying that for everybody but no, no, that's, we, no but that's, that's really, really good that's, advice and it's just because like not just because but like most because the like the social media stuff like I want to show everyone my perfect wedding stuff I know I know it's about the picture it's about the video yeah but anyways in the next day <clears throat> all right so pastor came up to me at the wedding date the day of the wedding, uh -huh. while everybody left the reception. And he Your comes pastor. Up, my pastor. And he comes up to me and he says, in front of everybody, in front of just me and Lisa and his wife, and, and says, you should be a pastor. Whoa. What? Because I sang and I was joking. And he came up to me, put his finger and said, you ought to be were a pastor. Were you leading something at the church at the time? I mean, I was just running a connect group. I was running a connect group. Which would be like a small group. And I was yeah. married to Lisa, and Lisa was on staff. Uh, mm. Yeah. And he saw something in you. He did. That's he, awesome. Oh, I, I need to tell you this. Before Lisa and I got married, he needed to su suss me out. 
he, he needed to make sure that I was the right guy. Yeah, for mm-hmm. Sure. Because yeah. it wasn't a huge church, about a thousand people, mm-hmm. but Lisa was on staff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he said, meet me at McDonald's 8 a.m. in Kaneohe. Mm. So I would drive 30 minutes to go meet Pastor at 8 a.m. at, at uh, McDonald's in a small town mm-hmm. where the church was. One Wednesday turned into eight Wednesdays. Whoa. She would just every like week discipleship stuff. He's not discipling me. No, he's just figuring you out. He's figuring me out. Uh, I mean, he's he's talking to me, but he's probably discipling me at the same time. Mm-hmm. He's trying to figure out: Am I a player? He's trying to figure out oh, what's my dreams, what's my goals. Yeah. And now yeah. he's not just thinking for his staff member's husband; he's thinking for the future, future pastor, for the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's when that's awesome. He put his finger. I know, I know. I'm I eternally grateful. That's awesome for So him. he says you should be a pastor. What, what do you think? I think it ruins my honeymoon. It ruined my honeymoon. It ruins your honeymoon? Because <laughs> you're overthinking all the time? Dude. Okay. You just gave me like this? this. Oh, I had a chunk of things. I had anxiety. Should we talk about this? I had anxiety. In my honeymoon, man. <laughs> He's in his... I mean, this is Elijah throwing his cloak on Elisha and walking away. Like, Let's drop the mic. Good honeymoon, man. And now you have two Dude. wedding night. Take care of business and deal with this. Yeah. Yes. At the same yeah. time. Yes. So, so now, first year marriage, what happens? Second year marriage, how do you get into ministry? Okay. Yeah. Um, after that happened, you know, I was full on into, into um, multi-level marketing. Mm. And I was, I was doing really well. I mean, I had big dreams. I was doing really well. Um, not as good as I wanted to. I wanted to be a millionaire. Mm. I wanted, I wanted, I was going after. You were always ambitious. I was always ambitious. Yes, that's, that's a great way of putting it. And I never well, saw when my, Jesus enter in your life. Like this, this not doesn't change. Like why I went, to, uh, why I went to become a millionaire, or no, no, never thought about it. No, the the the, the ambition was I want to be wealthy. To I wanna, fund. I want to do well, and I will fund the kingdom. Ah, you want mm. to fund the kingdom. I mean, I was That's already awesome. tithing as a single dad, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay? Like 21 years old, you write your first tithe check, oh, you got to pray over that check. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 pray. yeah, yeah, yeah. Parents, it means a lot. praying over that, that tithe offering. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was 10%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's no joke. It was no joke. And yes. God took care of me big time. And so I, I had the same mentality. But that's why you have the authority to teach people about it. Yeah. about it today yeah because you yeah. went through it yeah through the toughest times when I, you second guess this tithe check the putting it in the offering and you do it I never missed one I never missed a tithe check in 30 30 something years so on. so real quick let me get a detour That's on good. this thing what would you say to people that say that tithing is part of the Old Testament come on and uh, we're the New Testament church we shouldn't tithe how we, I mean, I'm sure you've you've had people say that to you, right? Yeah, yeah. Or, or mention that. that. Yeah. yeah. What, what would you What would you answer these people? I, I say Jesus addressed it in the New Testament, uh, and I would also say Jesus takes it to the next level. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's so it's go. not like he's saying, "I fulfilled the law and the prophets." That's done with. Uh, you, you would say he's actually saying the least that you could do is ten percent or eleven percent and above. Well, when he talks about and when he, he he talks about the Pharisees, he says you tithe on even your spices. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if tithing was not in the Old Testament, I'm not in the New Testament. Why would why would why would it be there? Mm-hmm. Okay, it's not an Old Testament thing. I think it also Jesus takes things to the next level. For example, where he says, "Do not commit murder." Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do not commit murders in the in the Old Testament. It's in the, one of the commandments. In the, New, in the New Testament, Jesus says, if you even think that kind of thought, you've already murdered in your heart. Mm-hmm. What about uh, adultery? Adultery, yeah. adultery yeah. same yeah. thing. You even look at a woman the wrong way. Yeah. Pluck You're out your eye. Adulter with her. Right? So he takes it to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, the tithing argument for me is, is I don't even entertain it. Um, people might say it. It doesn't matter to me because I know I've been doing it for 30-something years. And uh, I you see fruit. I see major fruit. Yeah. Major fruit. God has been so faithful. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. The principle works. Yeah, yeah the principle, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So um, so going on, so you begin as a um, youth pastor. Yeah. 
I, I he, he he says you ought to be a pastor. I had a crisis moment mm. um, about it, within a year, and I had to choose if I'm going down the multi level marketing route or I'm mm. going to go the all church route because it's hard to do both. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got about your motives are you can't be. In, I, I it's hard to be in the ministry and do that. You're going to get mixed like motives. Like the tent making thing is. I, it, I, I I agree with tent making, but certain kinds of tent making. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Explain. Like, well, the tent making that I could do is if, if I had a, a side business and let's say I was uh, I had a restaurant I had a coffee shop I had a florist yeah that's easy to separate those mm -hmm. some of them are harder to separate like if you're online coaching or consulting consulting people um, you have to draw clear lines because a lot of pastors are entrepreneurial mm. they're pastorpreneurs or they're entrepreneurs who are pastoral mm -hmm. who are called entre mm. entree pastors mm -hmm. so you're either pastorpreneurial or your entree pastor okay and you got to be able to draw the lines and even state where the line is yeah because you can like abuse your authority you can't you can't yeah you, it's, can. it's, yeah. you want to try to be ethical yeah oh wow Okay, so then, so then you you go. You, you have to train. choose. You have to choose. I choose. I chose. To, I, I chose ministry. Ministry, <laughs> and no job was offered yet. I chose the ministry. No job offered. They kept saying, oh, "We got to get you on staff. We got to get you on staff." We gotta, and finally, I said, "Keep saying that, but it's not happening." Mm. So they mm. created a, a special portfolio for me. They created a ministry, and says, "Here's what we want you to do. We want you to um, take the young married couples." And we want you to start a ministry with them. I said, what do you want me to do? Just have connect groups and do quarterly or twice a year events. It's up to you. Just grow it. So the multiplication factor came in because my, my, my pastor says, take one connect group, grow it, invite people, make it two. Now you've got two. I want you to grow it, invite people, and make it three and four. Mm -hmm. By the time I got done in two years, I went from one to 15 Wow. So I had 15 leaders, connect group leaders, who are leading their own connect groups of seven or eight people, mm -hmm. or, you know, eight, you know, three or four couples. And that's where I cut my teeth on that. In the middle of this process, you, you, you realize that your background of multi-level marketing helps, helps you? I would say it did. Oh, I would say it did. I would say even the multi-level marketing about sharing the plan. Mm -hmm. Like vision casting? Vision casting on vision a whiteboard casting. and drawing this plan and this is how you can become financially independent in a hostile mm. living room of people crossing their arms and looking <laughs> yeah. at you like, yeah, oh, right. <laughs> and like I would drive in with my, rust, my rusted out Datsun B210 mm -hmm. four speed Datsun before there was a Nissan. Dotson. Dotson. I parked around the corner so nobody could see me. And I'd walk up. And then, hey guys, so yeah. uh, my Uber so you're just, driving yeah, this yeah, yeah, yeah. Dotson, teaching yeah. people how to get rich. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And so um, I ended up doing that. And then, you know what? It's crazy because somebody asked me, so, so how much money are you making? I said, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> like, you told me how much money I'm going to get if here, I right? Told you, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah, it's crazy. It's That's crazy. funny. Yeah. That's funny. So then, um, after two years of doing that, and I, and I enjoyed it, but it was easy. It was too easy. The youth pastor got let go, and Pastor Ralph says, come on, let's go take a walk on a Sunday morning in between services. And that's how our pastor loved to do it. He, he, he liked to process with you. He, he gave you the privilege of processing with you. He never just came up and gave me the decision. Mm. Uh, I try not to be that way of just giving my staff decisions. Oh, I've decided you're going to do this role. I, 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 want, I want the privilege and honor of walking with them and they are thinking with me. And I also want it the other way around too. If they're thinking of doing something different with their life, they don't come into my office. I need coffee with you and sit down and drop the ball, or drop the hammer exactly. and say, I'm gone. Yep, We're yeah. moving to this other state. We're going to go with this other ministry. Uh, my <laughs> yeah. wife and I said, no, I mean, I, I said, well, thanks for the honor of the journey with you. Exactly. I mm -hmm. want to journey your decisions with you. I don't want to control your decision. I yeah. want to journey your decision because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I want God's best for you. And if yeah. that's God's best for you, then it's God's best for me. Mm. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. honoring, right? For yeah. you. It is honoring. And, and, and you also the give process. them yeah. the ability to have ownership in the decision as well. But I also felt honored that he would take me on a walk and talk out loud mm. with me. I'm thinking about you maybe becoming the youth pastor. I'm like, oh, okay, wow. You know, that's a big move. If yes. you're a youth pastor, you're gonna be a senior pastor. We're in our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh no. 
I'm going to be a senior pastor. I don't know. I don't know if I want to do that. So I start going <laughs> ten years down the road, mm-hmm. yeah. rather than just next week. Yeah. And says so. He says like, oh, look, you're gonna um, are you gonna take over? I think you're gonna do great. Um, I said, can I pray about it? And he goes, yeah, you can pray about it. But I kind of already made the decision. But I want you to know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just I'm just telling you. Yeah, you I'm not, pray I'm not asking it, you. I'm just telling yeah, you. You can pray totally about it. Totally pray about it. Yeah. 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 I made a decision. You know, but pray about it. <laughs> make, do the same thing with us. Right. <laughs> I remember, yeah, he, he makes the oh same thing. Oh my god! So yeah, yeah the sure. you're ready. Pray on it. No, you can pray like you have. Pray on it, but fifteen minutes. But so. you start tomorrow, okay? <laughs> <laughs> pray on it, but you start this tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Men with vision do like do things like this. So, so you say yes, obviously. Yes, I said. I and said then yes. you go um, years as youth pastor. Five years. And then senior pastor. Yeah, five years of the best years of my life. And you become the senior pastor of the same church, or what? No, um, I was going to be one day. Okay. Um, I was, and he even told me he was going to give me the church one day. Um, he came up to me and said, "I came home from vacation. I got my first check from preaching at a youth camp in Oregon. I wanted to be a youth speaker. That's what that was my goal. I want to be a, on the circuit." Um, the circuit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dinner and ministry. Oh my God, traveling the whole America, like the whole yeah. world. Why, why are you putting it down, dude? This is so funny. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone passed for this hey. space, right? Yeah. What? <laughs> no, sorry. No, I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way oh you say it. I'm gonna oh my gosh. Travel. Like, oh my God. It's so bad. I'm going to travel the whole world. I want to. Hey, yeah, I did. I did. I did. I did. Yeah, there was a guy named. <laughs> There was a youth ministry in America called Youth Youth Specialties, and they were the best equippers of youth youth workers in, in America. And they they were around for twenty five years. Youth Specialties, yeah, yeah. A guy named Tick Tony Long, Tony Jones, Tick Long, Mike Iaconelli. Special, yes, Mike Iaconelli. Iaconelli, bro, he was my man. Yes, they were out of yes, San Diego. Yes, yes, yes. And so they had brought on Miles McPherson, okay, to be on their traveling team. A guy named Ephraim Smith. Oh, I know Ephraim. Okay, I don't yeah. know him, but I. To me, I'm like, yeah. I don't that's know. what I want to do. Yeah, that's what I want to do. I, want, I, I know who everyone was part of that. Oh, I, want, I, I want to be on that that, that crew and still mm. youth pastor my team and what God gave me. Uh, so I get, I come home from Oregon. I opened up my honorarium check. This is the first time because in youth pastors, when you do a youth uh, in Hawaii, when you do a youth camp, you invite your other youth pastor friends to preach. Exactly. And when they come, what do you do? You 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 give them a plate a pizza. lunch. A plate lunch. <laughs> Pizza's lunch. Here's what you get to eat. Here's a camp shirt. And then you give, each, shirt. you give each other a high five and a hug. And that's yes. what you got. But this is the first time I was, I was flying back and I actually got paid. Mm-hmm. And I opened the check and I'm like, oh my gosh. Wow. I'm going to beginning. I'm going to I'm going to be a youth pastor forever. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm taking kids to Japan. For missions trips, yeah, we've got a pipeline going to Azusa Pacific for college. Yep, mm-hmm. I'm showing up at high school football games. That's where my mom went to school. Oh, yeah, your mom went to APU. Yep. Wow. Yeah. I end up uh, being the chaplain of the football team, the basketball team for the high school. You know what I mean? It's life is good as a youth pastor. You have your senior pastor, mm-hmm. who has all the responsibility, and the youth pastor that has none of it. Yeah, you know I mean? all fun and games. All fun and games. All fun wow. and games. No, just kidding. And um, I'm, you're, are you the youth pastor? Are you the pastor? No. no. Yeah, you are. Kind of, kind of. Kind of. Yeah, you are? Yeah, all right. What do you mean kind no, of? I'm not the pastor. What do we I'm pay a, you I'm for? A youth, I'm a youth leader. I'm a youth leader. I'm a youth leader. I'm a youth leader. <laughs> okay, okay. But yeah, I got you. Yeah, so um, when Pastor Ralph comes up to me, he says, there's, there's a church that wants you. I'm like, okay. Like, I, like he doesn't know I got I got more than a t-shirt you know I'm like okay and I told him I got paid to, just so he knows I'm up and up <laughs> and, and hey, just so you know yeah just so you know I, I mean I, I think it's right right kind of like yeah, yeah, yeah if you're getting no no yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> I'm becoming a big no, deal man not like I was a big deal you know who I am <laughs> <laughs> no I was just being ethical like, yeah yeah just yeah, so yeah, you know yeah, yeah. I got paid like if if, if someone the congreg- sure, yeah. congregation gave me a gift I just I would report it. Hey, just so you know, so and so gave me a gift. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so he says there's a church that wants you. I'm like, where? He says it's on that side of the island, the dry side. 
oh, nah, I don't want to go. He goes, no, no, can you pray about it? I said, I don't need to pray about it. I said, Pastor, I don't like... Now you don't want to pray about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like that side of the island. It's hot. It doesn't rain. I don't like it. And I said, by the way, do we have a church there? Yeah, it's called Hope Chapel West, uh, Hope Chapel Waikele. Hope Chapel Waikele. I've never heard of it. How long has it been been around? 13 years. 13 years. What's wrong? He goes, well, the guy is burned out. He's been there for longer than four years and hasn't grown. And I go, how many pastors has it had in 13 years? He goes, he would be the fifth. I said, what's wow. wrong with that church? Like, this is, this is me yeah, now. Back yeah, 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 yeah. What's wrong yeah. with that church? It's a pastor's graveyard. They're eating mm, up their pastors, yeah. spitting them out. And like, how many demons are in that church? <laughs> I'm not going over there. Are you crazy? I thought you loved me. He's like, no, I'm good. No, <laughs> to be just pray about it. Pastor of my whole life. Yeah, yeah. I, said, I, wanted, I don't want, I want to serve with you. I don't yeah. want to leave pastor. He's a, pray about it. I thought about going. I'm like, no, are you serious? So I have my youth camp that week. Mm. Crazy stories happen of providence, of providence of this and that. The former pastor, who's about to be the former pastor, came to my youth ministry one night. I never met him in my life. He came because he brought somebody with, he was brought along with somebody else who was speaking at my youth ministry. We had an encounter in the, in the, lock, in the, in the locker room, in the lobby. Court, in the lobby. In the lobby. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, did Ralph put you up to this to come here and talk to me? He's like, no. No, I came here on my own. Mm. And I said, wait, wait, you're quitting. He goes, how do you know? I said, I know because Ralph just told me. He offered me the church. He goes, you should come. You should take it. And I was like, I'm not going to take the church. I don't want your church. He goes, no, come, come preach at it one time if you like it. I said, how unethical is that? You want me to come preach? <laughs> and if I don't, and if I like it, if the people like me, then, I, then I'll then i become the pastor? I'm like, that would be like manipulation of the people. Mm. I said, I'll come to one service but I won't preach. He goes, okay. And that's how it all started. I go up, I go up to the mountain in my own camp every day. I take my cup of coffee. I overlook the plains from the valley of where would the church would be and I'd sit there and I said, God, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. But if you want me to go, I say, I love these kids. I love the church. I love our pastors. I don't want to go. But if you want me to go, you got to change my heart. Mm. Next day, same cup of coffee, different cup of coffee, same view. Same God, prayer. Same prayer, but it changes. Oh, prayers like changing like day by day I don't want to go but God if you want me to go because the presence of God is at that camp you know what I'm wow. saying mm. and I'm going if you want me to go I don't really want to go but I'll do whatever you want me to do but I don't want to go wow. now day three day four by the last day I'm like with my cup of coffee overlooking and I'm like this is the last day of camp God if you want me to go I'll go but you gotta make it real clear and he goes, okay, and, and I go to my camp. My wife calls me up. I'm like, guess what? I go, what? I miss you, babe. She goes, I miss you too. I said, babe, what's up? He goes, we just got uh, like two, two free nights at the, at the Hilton in Waikiki that this one family gave to us because they're so grateful for you know, the youth ministry. I'm like, great. I can't wait to see you. It's going to be alone, just me and you. And she goes, yeah, just me and you with no kids. I'm like, oh, praise God. Awesome. Let's go. She goes, yeah, but guess what? I go, what? We're going to fast and we're going to pray on this trip. I'm like, no, we're not. She goes, yes, we are. We're going to fast and pray if we, if we need to go do this church. Whoa. I said, we, 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 let's go to Waikiki first, then fast and pray. She yeah. goes, no, <laughs> we're going to fast and pray. I said, who holiday? fast and prays in Waikiki? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> She's like, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take this serious, Mike. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. So we fast and pray for two full days. I look at her before we leave. I said, what are we doing? What do you think? And I already knew God had changed my heart already. She says, I believe that you are called to go take that church. I said, babe, you know, there's only 60 people, only 10 grand in the bank, and no office, and no building. It's a cafeteria. Doesn't matter. If God's calling you to go, we got to go. So I called wow. Pastor Ralph. I said, Pastor Ralph, this is Mike. I'm leaving Waikiki. Can we talk? He's like, yep. Great. So I go straight to his office, because he's always there on a Friday afternoon, because he had a Friday evening service. I go straight to the, the, the office and I say to him, I said, Pastor Ralph, okay, I'm sit down. All right, Lisa, and I prayed about it and it's been two weeks and I know you need a decision by tomorrow because uh, the other pastor is ready to leave. Mm -hmm. He's burned out. And I said, um, I got to ask you two questions. Okay, go. Number one, why the suburb? Why so far? Why not in the city? You know, there's this church in the city. There's the other church in the city. They're doing great. Why, why, why am I going out to the suburb? 
Uh, and he says, well, you know, when Jack Hayford started his church, it was called Church on the Way. It was on the way to another place. Mm. On the way. So this church was started by Jack Hayford? No, no, no. When Jack oh, Hayford, oh, oh, when he started his yeah. church. Okay, his church yeah, yeah, is yeah, called yeah, Church yeah, on the yeah, Way. Church on the Way. On the Way to Heaven, but also on the Way to Palm Springs. Okay. Because mm. it was so it was so out there. Van Nuys, California. Yeah, yeah. In the sixties yeah, yeah. and seventies was out there. Now yeah. the growth caught up to him and mm. passed him. Yeah. I said, yeah. okay, okay, I get that. And my when biggest, they call you and say, where are you? Oh, I'm on the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the final one was when I, I said this. This is the, the most. The other question. The other question. I said, is this your way of trying to make room for your son to come home and pastor the church or take over the youth ministry? Is this, is this how you're doing this? Because mm. I got to wow. ask. That was a, that was a, wow. Yeah. That yeah. was a, a, a question. question. It question. was, because I got to know. Yeah, I said because if you want me to go do young adults, like you asked me last year, I'll do young adults. If you want me to do something different, I'll do something different. But please, if you're manipulating the situation Just and to pull your son, to pull your son in, man, to get me out, then I will blame you if I if I do not succeed. I said because then you'd be pulling the strings. I said so. My question is, are you trying to make room for your son? He started crying. And he looked at me, he says, you are my son. You are my son. Wow. I started crying. Wow. And I went like, okay, then he wants the best. And then he said, this is beautiful of him. He said this, okay, okay. He goes, Mike, if it doesn't work out, you can always come back. I said, no, I'm never coming back. I said, I can't thank you for the parachute. I, I don't want one. I said, I have to succeed. That's I have good. to. Come on. Yeah, and he goes, That's okay. That's awesome. Just want to let you know it's, it's there if you ever need it. And I was like, in my heart, I went, no. Mm -hmm. Cannot. You cannot have that backdoor option. Yeah, no plan B. No plan, plan B. B. Come on. And that's how I started. Started with 60 and, people. And, and that church wow. is what today is Inspire. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome, man. 2001. 2001. 21 years. So you took over that church in 2001. Mm hmm So 2000, you were still under uh, the other church. Yep. Yep. Wow. Hope Chapel, Kaneohe. So like when Pastor uh, Solid Rock was going on in, in, in Kona, you were with? I was with Ralph Moore. Wow. I didn't meet Tex until probably 2005. Got it. And that was a big inspiration, Solid Rock Church. Yeah. Which was oh. my church when I was yeah, yeah. living in Kona back in the day. That's but anyways, uh, that's, that's really cool. So, so 2001, so 22 years of pastoring. 21 years, 21 years of church, uh, six, six or seven years. So I'm almost, no, 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 I'm almost 21, 22 years, 20, yeah, this year, will be tw years. this year will be 22, 22, mm -hmm. this August. God's been doing so much there, right? Yeah. Just tell us a little bit of what's happening with Inspire. Okay. So, um, I mean, multi-campus, uh, for sure. Um, we have a, a campus in Manila. Uh, we have thousands online and average about 18,000 people online watch us every weekend service. 18,000, 18,000 online. Whoa. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, we've had our best year ever. We've had thousands of salvations, thousands of decisions for Christ That's um, awesome. in the last year. Um, we are behind the curve. We need to catch up. Um, we need to steward all the salvations and the people that we have. And uh, it's, we've, act, we've been having a move of God. And it's like, it's happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. Not widespread yet, mm -hmm. but I believe it's the beginning of a great revival that's going on right now. Like it's happening in your church. Mm -hmm. It's happening in Dunamis. It's happening at Inspire. It's happening with um, Benny Perez in Las Vegas. It's happening with people. It's happening with so many people. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I, w I want to talk about something like we're, we're having lunch another day and you as in like in a Hawaiian, you, you, talk, you, you told me that you want to talk about like the Hawaiian revival that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that revival, according to Elmer, Elmer Towns, the historian. My professor. Your professor at where? Liberty. At Liberty. Elmer Towns? Elmer. Yeah, Dr. Towns. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I had systematic theology with him. That must have been incredible. Oh, oh yeah, the guy's a brain. Wow. Systematic theology. I mean, there's a, there's a handful of people. In you, my opinion? Yeah. Closet charismatic. Closet charismatic. That's Closet my opinion. <laughs> I don't know him enough to, to, to give my opinion. Because I've, I've, I would go after class and ask him questions, and he would just like smirk at me. Like, do you print in tongues, Dr. Towns? 
he's he's a he's a co-founder at Liberty. No. So so it, at Liberty they say that it's Dr. Jerry Fowl and Dr. Towns. Wow. They're they're, they're listed as the co-founders. That's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. So the 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 Hawaiian revival. Okay. So the Hawaiian revival took place in the eighteen. The, the, the first missionaries came to Hawaii in 1820. Mm. Okay. Before that, the first time Hawaiians ever had contact with the outside world was 1778. In 1778, Captain Cook, on, on mission from England, England Britain, yeah. yeah, the, the crown, uh, his majesty, um, is, is set to explore. Of course, we all know that um, the British, the, the sun never set on the British Empire at mm-hmm. one point. The sun never set. So from Hong Kong to India to, you know, s- s- parts of South Africa, um, parts of um, the Caribbean. And now yeah. we're looking at the Pacific. We're looking at Hawaii. We're looking at New Zealand. Um, so they, they made a conscientious effort to go explore, and they did, and they found, they found us. They found the islands. In the middle of the Pacific, the most isolated group of islands in the world is the Hawaiian Islands. Wow. And they found us. They navigated it. And so as they did that, they knew they were headed towards New Zealand. So they find us, they go to New Zealand, they go to New Zealand, they map New Zealand, they map part of Australia, they come back through um, the Pacific to get to Hawaii again on round two. I forgot to tell you, on round one, they thought that Captain Cook and his big white ships with the white um, uh, sails, Mm -hmm. they thought that they were the god Lono. Mm. the god of the harvest mm. and the prophecy was Lono would be fair skinned on large canoes with big huge white sails so when Lono wow. comes in when Captain Cook comes in they start worshipping him they start worshipping him crazy on trip one wow. on trip one and so they they basically give him supplies everything they want they explore they're taking a look at the land they're scouting the land mm-hmm. yeah. uh, they circumnavigate some of the islands they map them all the islands, they name, they name it the Sandwich Islands after the, the, the Earl of Sandwich in, huh. in England. They we're called the Sandwich Islands now. Not, Island. Yeah. Not, not Hawaii. Not Hawaii. Dude. <laughs> sandwich Islands. I know, right? The Sandwich Islands. The, the story is, the reason why it, he, they called him the, the Earl of Sandwich was he was the first guy that didn't want to mess with a fork anymore. Grabbed two slices of bread, put the meat in between, and that's what I he heard. He invented the he sandwich. Invented the sandwich. <laughs> the Earl Let's of Sandwich. That man. Yeah. <laughs> and so Captain Cook goes back down to the South Pacific for his, you know, his journey there. He comes back up and then the Hawaiians figure out that he is no God. Mm. He bleeds. Mm. His men bleed. And they kill him. They kill him. Wow. In, Ke- in Kealakekua Kona. And they killed him in a pretty brutal fashion. How? Um, How? They, okay, there's a historical story, or there, there's a well-known story and, and a deeper historical story. Okay. Okay. The deeper historical story told to me by Hawaiian-blooded historians tells me that when Captain Cook was, uh, two, two twin brothers who were warriors stole his boat, his little dinghy boat, mm. his rowboat. Mm-hmm. They say Captain Cook couldn't swim, so he was furious. So out of his anger, he took hostage one of the twins. A fight ensued. A shot was fired. Blood. And now they were like, we've been had. We've been fooled all along. Yeah. And they kill him. And they uh, kill him. Because they, they see the blood. They did. They, they cooked did. him. In the emu. Captain Cook, they cooked him. In the emu. In an emu. In an emu. They cook Dude. Captain Cook in yeah. an emu. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the joke. I don't know if we want to put that in here, but yeah, they did. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's come back to revival. All right, let, let's stop eating people. Like. Yeah. They didn't eat them though. Oh, they, didn't they, they didn't eat them. They just yeah. They just cooked them. Just cooked them. Yeah. For the yeah fun just for of fun. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. They wanted the, the 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 mana or the power from him. Oh. oh. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy. That's what I've been told. That's what wow. I've been told. So then what happens? Okay, so they so, kill, kill Captain Cook. So they get out of Dodge. They, they, the crew goes berserk. Berserk. The British. The they British. leave. Then they leave. We don't hear from the British again until the 1790s when Co- Captain George Vancouver mm-hmm. comes. 
So now we've got people who are figuring out where we are, longitude, latitude, whatever it is. They know where, where, where we are on the map. So the French have come. I don't know, I forget what exactly, what year they came. The Russians came. I think the Germans came. The French tried to claim us, but they got the lower part, French Polynesia, Tahiti. Um, oh, yeah. So they tried to get us. I, I think God was preserving us mm. because when Captain George Vancouver comes, try to make amends, he brings like 10 heads of steer, cattle, and the cattle becomes the beginning of the cattle industry in Hawaii because they let them run free in Rome and they put mm. a kapu or a taboo on it, a do not touch on them. Mm. He says, you can't touch this. You touch it, you're, you're going to get killed. Mm. And they roam freely, they populate the islands, and so now we got to bring in the vaqueros, we got to bring in the cowboys from Portuguese. Mexico. Yeah, we bring them in. We bring in the Portuguese too, but not until sugar, until later. Ah, okay, okay. Mm. okay. The Portuguese came later, okay. Our cowboys were, that trained us were from Mexico. Mm. And they trained the vaqueros, Hawaiians. the pan paniolos. Yeah, they became paniolos, okay. And the paniolo is the Hawaiian word for vaquero, mm. okay, not cowboy. But Hawaiian cowboys became some of the best in the world. They were so good that they go up to the, uh, what do you call it, the World Cup of... of uh, yeah, the Rodeo. The, the Rodeo World yeah, Cup yeah. In, in Wyoming. And a guy named Ikua Purdy goes with his, with his brother and his friends. They were assured in 1917, something like that, they were assured that we have horses for you. They get there. They say, well, nobody promised you horses. I don't know where you heard that. So what do they do? They go into the wilds. They find wild horses. They oh, tame right. them. Whoa. And they use them and they win. Wow. He wins That's the gold crazy. medal. That's crazy. Hawaiian Cowboys. Wow. So now. Hawaiian Cowboys. You never thought about that, this. That'd be a good name for, for a band. Yeah, Hawaiian, Hawaiian Cowboys. Cowboys. Hawaiian Cowboys. Come on. So um, by 19, uh, 1809, 1808, there's a young boy now. Okay, Hawaii is ruled by chiefs and kings, but there's always a, a, there's always a struggle for power. There's always war for power. And now what begins to happen is there's a, a king named King Kamehameha the Great. Uh, he will become king. Okay, he's amazing. Yeah, yeah. King Cam the Third's grandfather. Yeah, King Kamehameha the Third. Yeah, we don't shorten it, Cam. Oh, yeah. we can't do. We don't do. No, you don't shorten it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. So it's King Kamehameha the Great. He unites the islands with bloodshed. Okay. Mm. He subdues all his enemies. They all take off their crowns, basically, and they say, "We are your subjects." So now he he rules all eight islands. He unify the islands. He unifies the islands. Mm -hmm. But in 1809, there was a war that was still going on, and during that war of trying to unify the islands, uh, there's a young boy. The focus is on a young boy. Uh, his mother and father are killed by a warrior. That warrior kills his mother and father in front of his very eyes during war. The boy picks up his little brother to run away, and as he's running away, that warrior picks up his spear, throws his spear, the spear goes right into the little baby brother's back, and his little baby brother dies. His name is Opukahaia. Opukahaia now is property of this warrior. This warrior now- Like a slave. Like a slave. Mm -hmm. He takes him to, um, okay. he takes him to where he was where is he? I'd love another cup if that's possible. More coffee. Mm. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, me too. So he goes to um, the district of Kohala, mm -hmm. where he's been to, about 90 miles away. It takes him with him. So now we got murder. We've got human trafficking. Mm. And this kid's got PTSD. Wow. And when you say kid, how old is he? They were saying he was about 10 years old. Ten Man, like, a, like a little boy. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. 10 years old. He was trying to run away on the lava. It's not easy to do so, so, with his little baby brother on his back. So now he becomes the property of this warrior. Wow. And it was a makahiki season. The makahiki season is where there's no more war. In the springtime when kings went out to war, uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay, there's, the makahiki there's, a, season. there's a season for war. And this is with our peace. In a season for peace. Yeah. This was a season of peace. Mm. And during this part of the season of peace is where you have these games, this is like Hawaiian Olympic games. Mm. He has an uncle. His uncle is a kahuna. A kahuna is a high priest. Thank you so much. The kahuna is the one that is probably the smartest man in the room. Mm -hmm. 
because he has to learn genealogy going back a thousand years because you, you have to know your genealogy. Mm. Okay? He knows genealogies. He knows chants, stories called Mo'olelo. You got to have the story down. And when you pass that story down, it's done in chant. It's done in oli. There's a rhythm to it. There's a mm. rhythm to the song or the chant. It helps wow. you memorize, right? Yes. It helps you memorize. Like A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. Okay? Same thing with a chant and an oli. There has to be a memorization. He's the smartest man in the room. He knows, um, he knows herbs that will heal you. He knows all this. And then he can also cast a spell on you. He can mm -hmm. curse you. He can also heal you. Okay? Like a witch doctor. Yeah, like a witch doctor. Yeah. Witch doctor. Um, I'm not going to do, I, I don't know enough about um, witch doctors to put the equivalency, but I even use that expression like that. Okay? But still the smartest man in the room. Mm -hmm. And his uncle is that kahuna. His uncle sees his nephew. That's my nephew. And pulls rank hey. on the warrior. Mm. and adopts him, or the Hawaiian word is hanais him, Hanai. and begins to train him in the ways of a kahuna. Disciple him. Disciple him. So he's got the whole memorization going down. Mm. So he's like educating this kid? He's educating him. Mm -hmm. But Opukahi is not, I don't think he's buying it. He's got a broken heart. He sees now Hawaii is being visited by whale ships and seal ships. It's a big industry back then, mm. huge. In fact, Lahaina, Lahaina Maui used to be the, 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 the capital of Hawaii because it was the whaling center uh -huh. of the Pacific. So you'd have ships, they come to Hawaii to re resupply, resupply fresh water, hogs, chickens, and go, go to, they'd take their seal pelts or their beaver pelts and they'd go all the way to China, they traded with China, and they would actually bring back China. China mm. plates, chi you know, oh, okay. dish, yeah, yeah. dishes. Porcelain, yeah. Porcelain mm -hmm. to bring to the stores in New England. Mm -hmm. So he sees these ships going back and forth. He's got a broken heart. He's fine trying to figure out his purpose. He's only, what, 13 years old now? 14 years old? Mm -hmm. And he and his friend Hopu, they called him Thomas Hopu, and Opu Kahaia would be called Henry. Those two boys asked Captain Caleb Bricknall if they could come aboard the ship. He invites them up on the ship. They decide they want to go where he's going. They want to go where he's going. Sail off. Sail off. Yeah. Uh, his uh, Opukaia's uncle will not let him go. Um, so he sneaks out of the, the, the hut another day, makes his way back to the ship. Captain does a bargain with his uncle, says, I'll take care of him. It gifts him, gives him gifts. And Opukaia is set in sail for China. He's setting sail for off the coast of Mexico. He'll go down Cape, Good, Cape of Good Hope. He'll come wow. up around mm -hmm. by the Falkland Islands. He'll come all the way up by all Cuba. Way, yeah. He'll pass by Brazil. He'll go all the way up and he will stop in New York and eventually in Cornwall, Connecticut. Um, while he's there, he's taken under the wing of several pastors. <clears throat> Um, also by under the wing of the president of I think Yale Yale University Yale, Yale Yale University yes it was Yale I think it was Yale I Yale. should know this I always get Harvard and Yale mixed up um, I but, think it's Yale but the president's the last name, time I heard you talk about it in Hawaii it was Yale the president's the name of the president of the university though I remember that his name is um, Edwin Dwight mm. and there's a picture online of Opukahaia on the stairs of that university crying and a picture of Edwin D Dwight looking at him and helping him up. He says, why are you crying? He says, nobody teach me, nobody teach me, nobody teach me. And he wanted to learn. He's got the mind wow, he's of, hungry. A, of a kahuna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kahu in Hawaiian means shepherd. Kahu. Kahu. K-A-H-U. Right. Yeah. Kahuna. Kahu means shepherd. Wow. So he's got the mind of a shepherd, shepherd of a kahuna, memorization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm, let me speed this up. <clears throat> he starts to learn so quickly. He begins to become even more civilized than ever before. Okay, he's looking like a New England New Englander with brown skin. He's a handsome young man. By the time he's done, he has the equivalent of an M div. Mm. He's got Greek, Hebrew, Latin, Hawaiian, and English. Five languages. 
Wow. Fluent. Fluent. That's amazing. And then, so he convinces the board of missionaries in Boston that instead of sending all of your missionaries only to Africa or India, send them to Hawaii. To Hawaii, Hawaii as well. And they decide that they, they will. So they, they tell his story. Well, the sad part is in 1818, um, Opakahia gets sick and Opakahia dies. Mm -hmm. He dies of typhoid fever. It's a sad story. But there are never made it back. Never made it back. His body made it back to bury him, but he never made it back. Well, actually, they buried him in Cornwall, Connecticut, in a cemetery at the church he was at. And on the bicentennial, is he still there? No, they exhumed his body, oh. his remains, and they brought him back back to Hawaii, back to Hawaii, back to Hawaii in Kona, and they buried him there. Wow. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. Wait, and, where is he buried in in, uh, in Kona? <clears throat> Do you know? I think it's Kahikolu Church. I think that's what it's called in Kialakikua. Wow. Yeah. She would have known that before. Yeah. It's, 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 it's pretty fascinating. So, so after that, like, it started like this huge wave of, wave of missionaries coming to... It, it, started, it started like this. Their friend said, because he died, we have to go now. Have to now go we're going to go. So the board of missionaries, the ABCFM board of missionaries, begins to recruit who's going to go. The Hawaiian boys are going to go back too, but who's going to go? Who steps up? Asa Thurston, uh, Hiram Bingham, uh, Elisha Loomis, Chamberlain, uh, Goodyear. These wow. guys all, st all step up. One of them has a wife and three kids. The rest of them are all newlyweds. As a matter of fact, Hiram Bingham didn't have a wife. And they said, Hiram, you can't go unless you get a wife. We, we can't have you falling in love with the girls there. Mm -hmm. So he prays and prays and prays. <laughs> he gets recommendations. Why couldn't he fall in love with the girls there? Right? Yeah, with the Hawaiian. No, because they're not Christians yet. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, the missionary, the, yeah, missionary the evangelistic writing, writing wasn't a thing back yeah. then. Yeah, it's, it's still a thing. Missionary it's still a thing. <laughs> oh, I want him to come to Jesus. Yeah. Evangelistic right. dating. <laughs> Evangelistic dating. Come on. So he is. So uh, how many kids come to Hawaii? Four kids, two pregnant women. And you're talking like what? Early twenties, late teenagers. Oh, early twenties. Early twenties. Oh, early twenties. Early twenties. Christianity explodes there. <sighs> it didn't. It didn't. It didn't explode. It didn't. No. It, you're taking a civilization that is a concept of many gods. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to, yeah, they're polytheistic. And you're trying to bring in a concept that there's only one and he has a son. And he died on the cross for you. Yeah, and died. Right. So counterculture. Yeah, it is yes. so disruptive. Oh, and, and also, they like came, God can bleed, God can die? What? Yeah. And they brought in this, they, when they came, the king, so how's this? Okay. You want me to tell this part, right? Black box? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so when Opakaya dies, the mission is going, and they leave in 1819. In 1819, they leave Boston. They've got, you know, these five families are coming, and now the, the ship is coming, and now what happens is when they land off of the coast of the big island, when they land there, they find out when they land there, okay, they're in quarantine, they're in customs, customs in quarantine right now. They find out from Kalani Moku, the chief, that Kamehameha died. Kamehameha the Great died. Mm -hmm. He died when they left Boston, they didn't even know. They were like, what, the king is dead. And during that period, there's a break in the kapu system. Mm. The kapu is do not touch, do not eat, there's, there's, child, there, there's human sacrifice, there's murder. Mm. It's heavy. Okay, it's oppressing, um, and but it worked. For, for it worked. It worked agriculturally. Mm -hmm. It worked. The system worked. No, so explain to us real quick what is the kapu system, okay. and, and why? I thought it was like the the Fijians or the Togans. Does that have to do with them? Um, no, it has to do with the Tahitians. Tahiti, Tahiti. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So the, the the belief is that the Hawaiians had a concept of a one true God all along. Oh, they had this. They had this until 800. So they were mo monotheistic. They were monotheistic. Before. Before yeah. 800. And the Tahitians came. In about 800 to 1000 AD. Tahitians come with a prince named Pa'au who comes with his swift canoes and they obliterate the, the ocean as far as the eye can see with warring canoes. 
and these canoes come over and take over a peaceful a peaceful I mean, people yeah peaceful people and they replace that one god with many gods Mm. And then they bring in a system, system. the couple system, which is intimidation. There's along with that, there's human sacrifice, there's death, um, and all of that. And for over a thousand years, they went through it. They went through it. The Hawaiian people go through it mm. until God preserves it. And in 1819, 1820, the missionaries land. And when they land, they find out that the kapu system had been broken. Who broke it? Not the missionaries. No, they the weren't king. even here. The king's son, who became Kamehameha the Great Son, Kamehameha II, mm. Kamehameha's favorite wife, Queen Ka'ahumanu, and his wife, who gave birth to his sons, Kawi, not, not Kawi Keoli, but I'll, I'll remember her name, but they break it and, and, and even with his general why, do, why does he break it? they break it because there's something wrong there's, they're, they're, there's, they're testing it there's, it's not working and the queen said these gods have done us no good mm. Mm. these gods have done us no good and so they eat together men and women could not eat together oh. women could not eat certain foods you couldn't even look at Ali'i or a king. If he did, you could be put to death. And so they said, this is, these gods have done us no good. And so what they do is before this even happens, okay, Kamehameha the Great has a high priest named Heva Heva. Heva Heva, along with all of his different uh, chiefs and the two queens and the new king, Kamehameha the Second, Liho Liho, I think it's Liho Liho, they decide that we are not going to abide by the kapu and they break it there's no thunder there's no lightning there's no earthquake there's no volcanoes mm. there's no curse on the land but Heva Heva told Kamehameha the Great when he was uh, alive he said a god greater than yours in a canoe greater than yours is coming and I must follow him Whoa. Wow. like a prophet yeah he was like a prophet Heva Heva was a priest and a prophet Okay. There's another priest called Kapihe who told him, who told him another prophecy, and then Heva Heva gets another prophecy, and it's, and it's widely known as the the black box prophecy. And he said God is coming in a black box. When he says that in the black box, Hawaiians don't have a word for box. I don't think Hawaiians have a word for box. And so when they land in Kona in in Kailua Bay. They offer a gift to Kamehameha II, and they open up a black box, and within the box is a black Bible. A black Bible. Wow. <laughs> oh, I knew this. And that, that's that, crazy. That's wow. crazy. They that's, landed that's on the Plymouth God's Rock of Hawaii. Totally. So now when you said, and it just blew up, no. When they came here, the culture shock, they went right to work. They brought a printing press with them. Mm. And they knew just from Opukahaia and Thomas Hopu and all of these different Hawaiian boys that were already in New England, mm. they hear that the Hawaiian, oh, you don't have a written language? Mm. You have an oral language? but Your oral language is beautiful, but you have nothing on paper? Mm. We got to bring paper. We got to bring a printing press. A printing press. So the oh. printing press, the job of the, the printer, Kinko's, the Kinko's guy, his name was Elisha Loomis. Oh, Elisha Loomis is the... The printer. So that book you showed me, that's his granddaughter. The great-granddaughter wrote that book. Great-granddaughter. Yeah. Wow. So, this so the Christians started like this whole movement of... of having, literacy. Literacy. Of literacy. It began with literacy. They, Just written, like in Germany with, with Martin Luther. Yeah, yeah Martin exactly. Yeah. Dude. Making the message of the Bible accessible to the people. Oral, oral language into written form. Yeah. Wow. Time. Just this is a, it's a revival. Just this. Like with no like a lot of salvation, but just this yeah. change yeah, it's of reformation. Culture. This is yeah. totally yeah, revival reformation. Oh, mm. It takes That's about awesome. fifteen years of preaching the gospel, winning the hearts of the kings, the Ali, the trust, the people, um, the favor of God, fifteen, sixteen years of their alphabet, their language being able to become the most literate people on the planet by 1836. Whoa. Most literate. Wow. Per capita. 15, 15 years. 15 years. Per capita. Per capita. Most literate people on, on the, the planet. planet. On the planet. What year is this? 1836? 1836. 36. Wow. So now what you have is waves of missionaries coming, being sent. 
some going home, some being sent, but they're still keeping up with the mission. And by the time the, the, the paper, the pala pala, it's called paper in Hawaiian, pala. with their words on it and the people becoming enlightened, like, oh my gosh, they mm -hmm. become the most literate people. Now, when they're reading the Bible, they would sit in circles and the Hawaiians knew, could read upside down. Because you're sitting in a circle, only one person had it right side up. That's crazy. Everybody was sitting in a circle, like, oh, they can read upside down. They can read it upside down. <laughs> yeah. And so. They learned it in two ways. <laughs> Dude. Yeah. yeah. These guys. So. Funny. Uh, That's so. Funny. That's good. The, the second or third wave of, of, of preachers that come, or missionaries that come, can preach. I mean, they can preach. They were disciples of uh, Charles Finney mm. uh, during that revival, and they come, and one of them is my ancestor, David Lyman. But after him, he handed off the baton to Titus Cone, and Titus Cone, in the little sleeping village, uh, fishing village of Hilo, of only 2,000 people, began to grow because of the gospel that was being preached, and people came from all over. Mm. That's amazing. Hilo, because of the, the home of Because of the preaching and the power, of God, power and presence of God. Wow, the power, the presence of God. Hawaiian class here, guys. He, Hawaiian class. Yeah, and he 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 learned to preach his first sermon in Hawaiian so, in three so months. He's the pastor of the biggest church. He was the pastor of the biggest church in the world at that time. That's in the right. world, ten thousand people. Eighteen. What, what year is this? 1835, 1835. 1836. Eighteen thirty-five, eighteen thirty-six. So the biggest church in the world was he in Hilo, Hawaii. In Hilo. 10,000. Wow. Whoa. That's I had cool. never heard of that before. Yep. It's most people that haven't heard about it. It's the greatest revival, one of the top 10 according to Elmer Towns. Okay. Wow. So why, why am I so into it? Because we need a revival in Hawaii. Yeah. We need an awakening, a reawakening. We need revival. We need the government. And reformation. We need reformation. We need yeah. our government to be reformed. We need people, society, our education system so, to be so reformed. So real quick, question that I, I, uh, I had. Yeah. Um, talking to Hawaiians, you get mixed opinions about the missionaries. Mm -hmm. Some people love them. Some people say it was like horrible. Yeah, they don't know. They, yeah. why, why would they think, well, love them, I would understand, but what, what, what did, why not good? Okay. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a very good question and it needs to be answered and this is my opinion and um, and other Hawaiians might have a different opinion and other scholars might have a different opinion and I, and I totally respect that but here's what I've learned over the years. Um, the reason is, is because they're displacing the blame of the overthrow on the Hawaiians, I mean on the missionaries, and they're thinking that, whole, that missionaries came here, their original intention was manifest destiny. Okay, manifest destiny. I mean, it is our destiny to rule the land where colonize. Yeah. Colonize. colonize. Well, yeah, we're gonna help you. Yeah, yeah. Um, wherever you put your, your foot um, is yours. It's the same thing with go east, go west, young man in America. It's like even the land grab in Oklahoma. It's that. Okay. And so it wasn't necessarily to enslave the people, but it was to the people. They, they wanted the land. Okay, they wanted our land. Not the missionaries, though. The missionaries came here with pure hearts. Mm -hmm. They came here for the gospel. They, in fact, most of the missionaries, half of them didn't stay and die in Hawaii. They went back. Mm -hmm. Just half of them died in Hawaii. And so last year, almost a year and a half ago, from the University of Hawaii, a professor named Ron Williams did for the UCC church, the United... Christian church, you know, the, that denomination is kind of liberal, very liberal actually. But for them, he is a independent scholar that set out to prove that the missionary's mission for coming here was to bring, not to bring the gospel, was to open the doors for the military to come in. Mm -hmm. We would come in, we're gonna love you first with the missionaries, yeah. then, our, then, then our government comes in with the, with the army. He set out to prove that. To the queen's head, right? Yeah, he, he, he set out to prove that. He set out to prove that. And I think they did put a, a, a gun to the queen's head. I think they did, I could be wrong. But he set out to prove that, guess what? In his mission to prove that, he realized he was wrong. Mm, wow. And he said the mission, <laughs> right? Careful what you study, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And, and he did a, a full online seminar, master class, teaching on the missionaries and their intentions and the good that they brought to Hawaii. Wow. That's awesome. That was just a year and a half ago. 
So that's cool. I can understand why the Hawaiians, uh, certain Hawaiians, not all of us, certain Hawaiians are upset with the missionaries. But I think if they understood that it wasn't the missionaries who did that, okay, the first generation missionaries did not come here for that. They came here to, to preach the gospel. Now, Hawaii was already, you already had businessmen and other people that were already had self-interest in Hawaii before the, before the missionaries even arrived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were Frenchmen that were here. You already had on Oahu. Um, Kamehameha had an advisor named John Young. John Young was British. John Young could never, he would never let John Young leave, but he gave him lots of land. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of gifts of land was given. Mm -hmm. um, and so people were already doing commerce in Hawaii before the missionaries even got here. So they were already businessmen. So we weren't the first white people. No, missionaries weren't the first white people to show up in Hawaii. They already were here. And then so now you had probably one of the greatest culprits was um, probably Sanford B. Dole. And Sanford Dole was the orchestrator from what I've, what, what I've read of the overthrow of the kingdom of Hawaii and, and putting the queen under house arrest. Mm. And in 1893, that's when we lost our, we, we lost our, our kingdom. Sovereignty. Our sovereignty, yeah. yeah. We were a sovereign nation. Mm -hmm. And we were annexed, and we no longer. So, so from that moment on, Hawaii becomes property of United States, but not a state. Not a state until 1959. So it becomes a, like, a, like the US Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico. Like it's a U.S. territory. Yeah, it's a territory. It's a territory. Mm -hmm. So we went from colony. No, we were never a colony. No, no, we were annexed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then from annexation, then we and became a, a territory. From territory, then we became a state. Oh, okay. Now going back to this, I, I, I want I want to address this. To the overthrow of the queen, the the queen gets overthrown, and now all of a sudden, Hawaiians get absorbed into the United States of America. A strategic point for a 50th state to be in in the middle of the Pacific for Pearl Harbor, it's strategic, mm -hmm. right? Or war, yeah, yeah, yeah. military. Yeah. So now, here's the here's how I can reconcile being an American, a Hawaiian who loves America and loves being a U.S. citizen. Okay, I'm a Hawaiian. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we, they displaced our king, queen. Now, I'm an American. I grew up in the United States of America. And now, how do I reconcile how my... my With totally different culture. Yeah. Because... Wait, before you go in there, let me just... Is it, is, I've heard theories that if America wouldn't have taken Hawaii as a territory, the Japanese would have taken them as a colony or, would you agree with that or no? Uh, it's, it's a strong probability. The Russians were already on Kauai. There was a Russian oh, fort. Russia. Mm. There was a Russian fort on Kauai. Mm. Yeah. The Russians are ready. The Russians were already in Hawaii. Kauai is a little bit more removed from the rest of the island chain, especially from Oahu, so it's easier to isolate Kauai. And in the island of Kauai, they, we had a Russian fort there. Wow. And, um, but they, you know, something happened, they didn't come back, but we already had people that wanted, the British wanted us. So if Everybody I had, was fighting for Hawaii. So if I, if I had my choice. Yeah, you would rather Brit stay British, with. Russian, or American. I'm taking the Americans. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the All Americans. Right. And so yeah. we would have been captured by somebody anyway. We would Got have been it. taken. That's what I think. So I'm grateful that um, we were at least absorbed by the United States of America. There's still there's still a lot of hurt with the um, Hawaiian community about the, the land, about values being priced out of paradise, all of that. There's, there's always going to be that, and and I empathize with that. Um, but at the end of the day, for me, um, I had to reconcile kingdom over nationalism or ethnicity. Kingdom over my ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and over my my citizenship. When you say kingdom, kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Oh, yeah. That's your primary yeah, sure. identity. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. And so, um, talking about kingdom in Hawaii, how would you say, like for somebody listening to this, not familiar with uh, Hawaiian um, expressions of the body of Christ, how do you describe it? Somebody comes from, I don't know, take uh, any other country, Mexico. Hey, what does the church in Hawaii look like? Well, uh, the church in Hawaii looks like multi, I mean, multiracial. Mm. 
okay, multiracial. There's no, there's no black. There's no white. There's we're all mixed. Yeah, we are the ultimate. I think we are the ultimate melting pot that actually gets along in the world. That's awesome. Um, when they came here, when people came to Hawaii, they came because of the sugar plantations, and they blended and stayed well together. It was amazing. Um, I, the, the, the church is multiracial. It's multinational nationalities. Wow. I don't like mm-hmm. to use the word racial. Multiracial. Yeah, yeah. We're a multiracial we're church. Man. We're multicultural. Yeah. Yeah. Multicultural. As yes, as the kingdom. Yeah. Um, Hawaiians, Hawaii people, love music, love to sing, presence of God, aloha spirit that goes along with the Holy Spirit, That's welcomed, awesome. loved, hugged, welcome, brought into the family. We already got the word adoption in our language called hanai. hanai. We've hanai. been adopted by Christ, you know, adopted into the family. Uh, so adoption is a kingdom thing. It's also a Hawaiian thing. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, very community oriented. Very community oriented. Um, very close knit. And I, I tell people who don't live in Hawaii, who live in Hawaii for two or three years, I said, look, if you, <clears throat> if you come to church and if you actually get involved in the life of the church and you love the people, you're going to find this, the hardest thing to do is leaving this church. It's going to be hard. It's very similar to Brazilian church, right? Yeah, I think so. Hawaiians and Brazilians, they, yeah, I mean. There's a lot of Brazilians in Hawaii. Yeah, a lot of Brazilians in Hawaii, but not a lot of Hawaiians in Brazil. I don't know. No, just kidding. Well, but, yeah. <laughs> but I love Brazil. I love Brazil. Brazil is amazing. I love the people, the culture, the passion, this church, Zion. Uh, I love Dunamis. I love your merchandise. I love everything. Yeah. You guys are amazing. We love you. So before we go, mm-hmm. um, pound for pound, how would you describe this book? I know you've told me, and uh, we translated this book into Portuguese and I know you have this translated into Spanish and it's been all over the place I mean what's the main thing why would somebody need to read this Uh, the book is basically a book of hope I think people have faith but I also think people need hope to go along with that faith Mm. Um, it's a story uh, basically pound for pound the pound for pound principle is doing the best you can with what God gave you the best you can with what God gave you so in other words it's based on the parable of the talents so I kept I kept telling my church when we're like 200 members we're not going to compare ourselves to that church those churches are awesome but we're going to be the best 200 member church in the state I don't care (laughs) come on and I would say the same thing that's so good we're not going to when we hit 700 we're not going to compare ourselves to anybody else we're going to be we're going to compare ourselves to ourselves and I started looking at boxing uh-huh. I kept saying pound for pound we're going to be the best church pound for pound let's go that's and, a great principle man right. I had never heard the pound for pound thing regarding comparison before. yeah because the, if you look at weight classes in boxing you have a heavyweight yeah. you have a featherweight you have a Walter like weight a Mike Tyson Floyd Mayweather exactly difference. you're not going to Mike Tyson will never box Manny Pacquiao exactly or Floyd exactly. Mayweather yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're in different weight classes exactly. so you can't compare them yeah but what you can compare is pound for pound who is the greatest fighter of all time no matter what weight class that is okay yeah. and that's the only way you do it is you go pound for pound these arguments will go on forever some will say Pacquiao some will say Mayweather some yeah. will say Tyson some will say Sugar Ray, Rock, Sugar Ray Leonard in your or opinion Popo. <laughs> 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 Who? Who? In, your opinion, Brazilian Brazilian Brazilian, Brazilian, in your opinion, right. who's the pound for pound best boxer? Manny Pacquiao. 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 Really? Yeah. Wow. It's Freak. my opinion. My I, opinion. I would have gone for Ali. Muhammad Ali. Yeah. 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 No. He's like amazing Tyson. too. Tyson. Yeah. Oh, yeah Tyson bro. was a beast. Yeah. They, well, I mean, the, there's just so many I great guys. Yeah. So that's awesome, man. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much, Pastor. It's my honor. Amazing. We love it. We love it. The, it was a pleasure for us. Like this whole it was a Hawaiian lesson. class. Yeah, it's a lesson. In my opinion, if you want to reform something, you have to respect the history. Yeah. You know, yeah. you you cannot like just change everything. You exactly. have to understand. Yeah. So we were we always praying for Hawaii and now your church inspired church so thank you so much Pastor we, we learned so much yeah. and you inspired us so much and you guys can have this book as well Pound for Pound here in Brazil you can get the English version yeah thank you Pastor yeah. thank you very very much it's been my honor it's been one of the greatest uh, ministry experiences that I've had in the last decade so thank you wow. very very much That's cool. thank you Pastor Taylor thank you alright pessoal voltando pro português 
Muito obrigado por ter assistido até aqui. Como eu te disse, esse livro Pound for Pound está disponível também em português, na 4 Ventos. O link está aparecendo aí, o QR Code para você pegar e também na descrição. Isaac, Tel, obrigado. Valeu, Tamo junto, até junto. o próximo programa.